I think, I think we should differentiate three projects which uh, uh, are not, are, are, seem to me to be easily conflated and are, are, and are, are distinct and, and independently worthy endeavors. Um, the first project with respect to morality is we could understand what people do in the name of, quote, morality. And we could look at the world, we could see all of these diverse behaviors and, and rules and cultural artifacts and, and morally salient emotions like empathy and disgust. Um, and we can see how this plays out in human communities uh, in our time and, and in history. And we could look at all that in a, as non-judgmental a way as possible and seek to understand it. And seek to understand it in, in evolutionary terms and seek to understand it in psychological and neurobiological terms as it arises in the present. Um, and we can call that complete set of data and that whole effort to be a science of morality. Uh, and that's a purely descriptive science of the sort that I hear Jonathan uh, advocating and as, you know, as he's practicing. And that seems to me for most scientists uh, to pretty much exhaust all the legitimate points of contact between science and morality and science and, and judgments of good and evil and right and wrong. Um, but I think there are two other projects that we could concern ourselves with and, and uh, are arguably more important uh, than that. And, the, and the, the second project would be to actually get clearer about what we mean and should mean by the term morality uh, and how it relates to human well-being altogether and actually uh, use that new discipline to think more intelligently about how to maximize human well-being. Uh, now, philosophers may think that that's begging some of the important questions, uh, and I'll get back to that, but I think that's, that's a distinct project. It's not a purely descriptive project. It's a, a normative project. How can we think about moral truth uh, uh, in, in the context of science? Uh, and a third project is, we, uh, is a, a project of, of persuasion. How can we persuade all of the people who are committed to silly and harmful things in the name of, quote, morality, to change their commitments, to have different goals, to have different uh, objectives in life, and to lead better lives. Uh, and that, I think that third project is actually the most important project facing humanity at this moment. And I think it actually subsumes everything else we could care about, from stopping climate change, to stopping nuclear proliferation, to curing cancer, to saving the whales, any, any, any big effort that, that requires that we get our priorities straight and marshal massive uh, commitments of time and resources can fall within, the, with this, the, within this project of, of uh, all of us converging on uh, the same kinds of economic and political and uh, environmental goals. And, I, and it seems to me that obviously that, that project of persuasion is a very difficult task. Uh, but it strikes me as especially difficult if you can't figure out in what sense anyone could ever be right and wrong about questions of morality and questions of value. Uh, and so that's project, the, the right and wrong part is project two, and that's what I'm focused on. Um, now, there have been impediments uh, uh, to focusing on project two, and uh, the main one being that most right-thinking people, most well-educated people, most well-intentioned people, certainly most scientists and public intellectuals and I would think most journalists, um, uh, have been convinced that something in the last 200 years of intellectual progress has made it impossible to actually talk about moral truth. That there is, there, there is no, and this is not because uh, human experience is so difficult to study or the brain is so complex, but just that there's no intellectual basis from which to say anyone is, is ever right or wrong about questions of, of good and evil and, and uh, human value. Um, so my interest is in, in trying to uh, undermine that intuition. I think, I think that intuition is, is, is born now of... Uh, uh, it's kind of the received opinion in science and philosophy, and I, I think it's, it's based on a lot of fallacies and double standards and, um, uh, frankly, bad philosophy that has gotten us to this point. Um, 
And the first thing I, I would point out is that we have, um, one thing I should, I should just point out is that this has consequences. I mean, so for instance, one signature moment where this, this bias against uh, Project 2 would, would be expressed was when, uh, in 1947, when the United Nations was trying to formulate its, its Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the, um, the American Anthropological Association stepped forward and said, well, you, you, you can't do this. I mean, to, to, to do this would be to merely be foisting one provincial notion of human rights on the rest of human culture, and any notion of human rights is the product of, of culture, and this is just an intellectually illegitimate thing to do. And this is, what, you know, this is 1947. This is essentially the best our social sciences could do with the crematory of Auschwitz still smoking. You know, and yet it's been long, long been obvious that we need some to converge as a global civilization on, on how to behave and how to treat one another. We need some universal conception of, of uh, right and wrong. Uh, so this, in addition to just not being true, I think the skepticism about moral truth actually has consequences that we, we really should worry about. Um, so one thing to observe is that definitions matter and we in, the, in, in science are always in the business of framing conversations, making definitions, uh, and there's nothing about that process that gives us epistemological relativism, that, 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 that nullifies truth claims. So in physics, we define physics as, you know, loosely speaking, our best effort to understand the behavior of matter and energy in the universe. Uh, so it's defined with respect to the goal of understanding how matter is going to behave. Now, anyone else is free to define physics in some other way. I mean, the, the, you know, a, a creationist physicist could come into the room and say, well, you know, that's not my definition of physics. I want my physics, I want, I want to simply match the book of Genesis. Uh, and we are free to exclude that person and say, well, you, know, you really don't belong at this conference. That's not physics as, as we are interested in it. Um, you're using the word differently, you're not playing our language game. That, that gesture of exclusion, in no sense, the, the fact that the discourse of physics is not sufficient to silence that guy, that that, 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 that person can't be brought into the conversation, doesn't nullify physics as a domain of, of right and wrong answers. Uh, and yet, on the subject of morality, we seem to think that the possibility of differing opinions the fact, the fact that someone can come forward and say, well, no, my morality has nothing to do with human flourishing. It has to do with following, you know, Sharia law. The fact that that position can be articulated, I hear people like Jonathan and certainly many philosophers saying, well, that proves in some sense that there's no there there. This is all made up. This is not, we can't, uh, the fact that you can articulate a different position is a, is a problem for the whole field. And I think it's not. So I think, uh, I think, we have, um, obviously we have an intuitive physics and much of our intuitive physics is wrong with respect to, to the goal of understanding how matter and energy are gonna behave in the universe. I'm, what I I'm, want to say is that mo most people, most of us, most cultures have an intuitive morality. And much of our intuitive morality may be wrong with respect to the goal of maximizing human flourishing. Uh, and that, uh, uh, and flor maximizing the well-being of conscious creatures generally. And so what I'm going to argue to you briefly is that the only, the only sphere of legitimate moral concern, really, when you get into the details, is the well-being of conscious creatures. Uh, and um, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words in defense of that assertion, but uh, I think actually that the, our sense that that has to be defended is, is uh, the product of uh, some uh, fallacious moves and double standards that we're not noticing. And I, I don't know that I have the time to, to uh, expose all of those, but um, I've introduced two things. I've introduced the concept of consciousness and the concept of well-being. So, so briefly, consciousness is the only context in which we can talk about value and morality and right and wrong and good and evil. Um, why is that not an arbitrary starting point? Well, what, what's the alternative? I mean, just imagine someone coming forward and saying, um, actually, I have this, this other source of value which has nothing to do with the actual or potential experience of conscious beings. You know, this is, this is, this is something that cannot affect 
the experience of anything in this life or in any future life. Well, I mean, if you, you put that thing in a box, what I think you have in that box is, by definition, the least interesting thing in the universe. I mean, it's, it's something by definition we cannot care about. Anything else that is going to be a source of value is going to have some relationship to the experience of conscious being. So I, I don't think consciousness is, a, is a, an arbitrary starting point. I mean, we are when we're talking about morality, when we're talking about right and wrong, and good and evil, and outcomes that matter, we are talking about changes in consciousness. Um, and so I would add to that that well-being is, captures uh, everything we could care about in, in the moral sphere. And then the task is, just, is to, to have a definition of well-being that is truly open-ended and can absorb everything we care about. So, and this is why I don't call myself a consequentialist or, or a utilitarian, because traditionally, consequentialists have have bounded the notion of consequences in such a way as to, as to make it seem uh, uh, a, a, brittle, a, a brittle and kind of body count uh, uh, exercise uh, that only you know, Aspergerian people could, could uh, adopt. Um, I think, I mean, you take the trolley problem. The, if there is just, in fact, a difference between pushing someone and flipping a switch, say, in terms of the actual Co emotional consequences in people, well, then that has to be brought into, a, into account. Uh, you take Peter Singer's shallow pond problem. We all know that it would take a different kind of person to walk past a child drowning in a shallow pond and, and say, I don't want to get my suit wet, than it takes to, to not open the, the appeal from UNICEF. I mean, it, 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 it says much more about you to walk past that shallow, shallow pond. And, 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 and if we were living, if we were all those sorts of people, there would be, be consequential ramifications as far as the eye can see. And, and uh, uh, so there's, it, it seems to me that the challenge is to really get uh, clear about what consequences are and what changes in, in, in um, uh, human experience are possible and uh, what changes matter. And uh, in thinking about this, and thinking about uh, a universal framework for, for well-being claims and for morality claims, I'm now thinking in, in terms of what I call a moral landscape, which um, I would suspect there's a, a place in hell for people who would repurpose a cliche in this way. But I, the phrase, a moral landscape, actually captures what I'm after. Because I'm imagining a space of peaks and valleys where the, the heights correspond to the heights of flourishing possible for, for any conscious system. And the valleys refer to, to the deepest depths of misery. And, and changes in, I mean, to speak specifically of, of human beings for the moment, any change that can affect the change, of, uh, of in human con a change in human consciousness would lead to a translation in that space. And so changes to our genome, changes to economic systems, and anything in between that can, that, that can affect human well-being, for good or for ill, uh, would, tra would translate into movements uh, in, in, a, in this hypothetical space of, of, of possible human experience. And uh, a, a few things drop out of this model. One is that it's possible that there are, are many peaks on the moral landscape, to, just to speak specifically of human communities. It, it, perhaps there is, there is uh, a way of, to maximize human flourishing in which we um, really follow Peter Singer as far as we can go and, and somehow train ourselves to be truly dispassionate to friends and family and just globally compassionate and globally concerned and, and not weight our children's welfare more than, than the, someone else's children's welfare. And perhaps there's another peak where we're biased as we tend to be toward our own children within certain limits and, it, and correcting for that bias by creating a, a social system which is in fact fair. Uh, and so there's, there, 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 could be, there could be a thousand ways to tune the variable of, of uh, selfishness versus uh, altruism to, to land us on a peak on this landscape. But there, there will be many more ways to not be on a, be on a peak. Uh, and it's possible to be wrong about how to get to the closest peak. Uh, and this, is, um, this, this falls out simply out of the observation that 
whatever conscious experiences are possible for us are a product of the way the universe is. I mean, this is, this is uh, our conscious experience is arising out of the laws of nature and our entanglement with the way the world is. And uh, it seems to me, therefore, there, this is a, d a domain of right and wrong answers to the questions of how to maximize uh, human flourishing uh, in any instance. Uh, and this is incredibly simple to see if you just if you just imagine two people on Earth. I mean, there's only two people alone on Earth. We can call them Adam and Eve. And you ask yourself, well, you know, is there a right answer or a wrong answer to how they might maximize their well-being? And clearly, there. I mean, the wrong answer number one: you smash each other in the face with a large rock. You know, this is not that's not the best strategy to maximize your your well-being in this circumstance. Um, and yes, there are zero-sum games that they could find, and they could, they, they, could be, they could be psychopaths, they could fail to collaborate. But clearly, the best answers to their circumstance are not going to be zero-sum. They're going to be, they're going to, they're, 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 the prospects of, of, of their flourishing uh, and finding deeper and more durable sources of satisfaction are going to be uh, exposed by um, some kind of cooperation. And, all the concerns that people normally bring in to, um, uh, you know, deontological concerns and, and a Rawlsian concern about fairness, all of that falls into this uh, vision of just how they would navigate the space of possible experiences, finding some peak of flourishing, even if it's not the only peak. And again, multiple, multiply equi multiple equivalent but different outcomes still gives us a realistic space in which there are right and wrong answers to, to moral questions. Um, and one thing we should not be confused about is the, the, the difference between answers and practice and answers and principle. And this is a fantastically complicated problem. And it, it gets more complicated when you add 6.7 billion people to Adam and Eve's circumstance. But I don't think it, it, it's not a different problem. It just gets more complicated. And uh, but by analogy, we could, we could think about um, economics. You know, is, is, is economics a science yet? Apparently not. I mean, judging from the last few years, it's, it would seem yeah, it's not. Um, maybe economics will never get better than it is now. Maybe, maybe we'll just fundamentally be surprised every decade by something that's happened and, and, and we're, we'll realize that we're blinded by just the complexity of the situation or our models suck or, um, but there's, to say that it's practically difficult or impossible to answer certain problems does not mean that there are not right and wrong answers to the problems. And nobody would say that there are no right and wrong answers to how to design economic systems or to respond to financial crises. Um, Nobody would say that it's a form of bigotry to criticize another country's or culture's response to a, a banking failure, say. Um, and, and just imagine how terrifying it would be if the smartest people around were all more or less in agreement that we had to be non-judgmental about everyone's view of, of economics and everyone's response to global economic uh, crises. And, uh, and yet that is exactly where we stand, I think, as an intellectual community on the most important questions in human life. And I, mean, I, I, you know, I don't think you have, you've enjoyed the life of the mind until you have seen someone, uh, some philosopher or scientist, talk about the contextual legitimacy of the burqa or female genital excision or um, any of these other practices that, that emerge out of other cultures. Uh, which are just so clearly the, the cause of needless human misery, and yet we have convinced ourselves that somehow we, that science uh, is by definition a value-free space, and therefore we can't make value judgments about uh, practices needlessly subverting our opportunity to live in a, in a, in a happy and sane world. Um, the truth is, science is not value-free. Science, a good science, is the product of a, of our making value judgments with respect to things like valuing evidence and logical consistency and um, 
parsimony and all, all other quite value-laden virtues. And if you don't value those things, you actually you can't uh, you can't have the scientific conversation. And, I, and I'm saying if you we we need not worry about the people who don't value human flourishing or human well-being. The people who come to the table and say, actually, you know, we just want to cut people's heads off at halftime at the soccer game because we, you know, are, we have a book that has been dictated by the creator of the universe. Um, that kind of conversation, we are free to say, well, that's not actually morality, just like your physics isn't physics. Uh, uh, and uh, it seems to me to be the same move, intellectually speaking. Uh, it seems to me to be cashed out by the same uh, entanglement with, with real facts about the, the way the universe is. In this case, in, in, in terms of morality, it's real facts about how the experiences of conscious creatures can change, for better or worse. Um, and uh, it seems to me to be scientifically just as legitimate. Uh, and yet it's, 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 uh, uh, it's not the project that most people engaged in a, in a uh, science of morality are, are uh, um, thinking about. So anyway, I think I'll just I'll leave it there. That was 20 minutes. So. Jonathan, perhaps. Uh, so, uh, Sam, I think it's very helpful to have these three projects laid out. And, you know, yes, I'm saying we need to start with a descriptive project. Uh, you're saying we're ready to move on to uh, clarifying what we mean by morality and then persuading people to adopt better morals. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's, it's very uh, dangerous to embark on project two until you really have done a thorough job of project one um, and exploring all the different realities that are out there. When you look at moralities that preach or that, that, that support violence against women and beheading, uh, then you're triggering all of our intuitions. It's very difficult for us to think about those moralities and take them seriously. But I'd like to push you on a morality which is much closer to home and not so outrageous, which is uh, uh, American conservatism. Um, one of my uh, sort of enlightenment experiences you know, was, was in India, saying, oh my god, these people aren't crazy. Another one happened to me when I happened to be in the Strand Bookstore in the late 1990s in New York, and I saw a book called Conservatism. I was going to teach a course on political psychology, so I just pulled it off the shelf. It was by Jerry Muller, edited by Jerry Muller. I just happened to sit there on the floor reading the introductory essay. And it was like the scales fell from my eyes, because he wasn't saying conservatism is justified because you know orthodox beliefs in God. And all. It was basically a practical defense. It was a practical argument about how when you organize society in certain ways with respect for institutions and emphasis on the family uh, and the importance of uh, you know, bad actions getting punished and not bailing people. I mean, it was basically an argument that conservative positions, conservative ideas lead to human flourishing. That had never occurred to me before. Yeah, no, but I, I'm completely open to that okay. that possibility. In okay. fact, I, I agree, as stated, I agree with it. Okay, yeah. so if that's the case, so suppose it turns out that if we really do project one, the description, the descriptive project right, uh, and we then move on to project two, linking, uh, linking various ways of living with human flourishing, so if it turns out that, say, Arthur Brooks is right uh, in his book about gross national happiness, that the happiest people are gun-owning, Republican, uh, family men, who, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, basically, the conservative lifestyle, which is oriented around family and not oriented around altruism towards strangers, but around your obligations to your, your, your family, your, your community. Um, if it turns out that, the, uh, uh, that conservatives are right and that uh, political liberalism leads to too much sort of uh, decay of common structure, would you then move on to uh, stage three and say, we scientists have an obligation to persuade people to become liberal, uh, to become conservative? Would you, would you well, agree I, well, with that? I think we have a, yeah, it, it, again, yeah. It, comes, it comes down to how you, there, there's a real difficulty in assessing well-being. If you just ask people, how happy are you, then it, it, it's given how uh, hard it is to, <clears throat> correct for people's differing expectations. I mean, how happy should people expect to be in life? I mean, there are people who are going to be overjoyed tonight just to have stopped their use of methamphetamine, and then there are people going to, who are going to be depressed tonight to have found that they slipped on the Forbes 400 list, and, the, and, and, and to, to equate you know, one person's uh, joy and one another person's depression there, it, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to, to define well-being in a way that is going to 
make us confident that, that we have, have assessed uh, these things. But yes, it, uh, all I'm saying is that there are right and wrong answers. So it's, it's quite possible that a conservative style of living um, in certain respects is, is better at uh, encouraging human flourishing defined in as open-ended a way as, as uh, we can define it. Uh, and, uh, what, I'm, what I'm arguing is that there are frontiers of flourishing surely that we haven't discovered and facts about flourishing about which we must be ignorant in the same way that there are frontiers of physics and chemistry and everything else that we haven't discovered and about which we're ignorant or mistaken. And once you grant that space, then you have to grant that some people are right or righter and, or, and some people are wrong or wronger about morality. And that seems to be something that, that you and other scientists tend never to want to grant. Yeah, that's not true. You're lumping me in with the moral relatives and anthropologists. Okay, well, that, but again, you, even you, in your talk, you conceded whether there was some ambiguity about whether you were a relativist and. John, John I'm not a moral realist. Right, okay, well, I'm but saying. You, you take the most extreme form of relativism and say that anybody who's not a realist like you is the crazy relativist who says, oh, who are we to judge Hitler? Well, no, but, the, but then the question is what, uh, what tools can you use to judge? And, if, and if, if you're using the same tools I'm using, then why not? Let's, let, what, let's just be honest about. The basis for our judgment. I mean, the basis is when push comes to shove, we are concerned about human well being. We may have slightly different ideas about what constitutes well being um, or how to get there, and that's all a, a, uh, open to, to um, conversation and negotiation and good science, etc. But there are people who cl at least claim to be playing a, a totally different game, um, and what I'm saying is that. Uh, we need not take them seriously in the same way that we don't take creationist scientists seriously, um, and for, for often the same reasons. Um, but yeah, no, it, you know, it's there are ways in which uh, I mean, it, the project one, the descriptive project, is is in, incredibly important. Certainly, the, the, the psychological and neurobi neurobiological aspect of it. I think the the evolutionary aspect of it is not so, it's fascinating, it's not so important for our purposes because the truth is we don't really care why we're in the situation we're in. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it, for instance, you could give a project one to talk about you know, gender issues, the treatment of women. We can give a, an evolutionary rationale for why most societies tend to treat women like the property of men. Right, you know, we come from a long line of men who were ill-disposed to raise another man's child. Um, project one would be to describe that in evolutionary terms, to describe, and the, the psychological and neurobiological project might be to to scan the brains of men who are feeling their honor offended and feeling, you know, a proprietary relationship toward women, etc. Uh, but project two would be to discover whether and why and to what degree human communities and individuals begin to flourish more when you when they outgrow this kind of Bronze Age attitude toward women. Um, and I think we already know enough to know that they do flourish more. We know that life in Afghanistan where women have a literacy rate of 12 percent and have a life expectancy of 44 years and are forced to live in cloth bags, we know that that is not a circumstance of, of, of human flourishing. We know it's not a, a, a moral alternative, a moral counterpoint that we have to take seriously. And I would, but I would grant you, I would, I would, I'm prepared to understand everything I don't understand about other cultures. Uh, and I am by no means advocating that we take the, the idiosyncrasies of Western culture as, by definition, uh, a peak on any kind of moral landscape. Okay, but if religious conservatives and Orthodox Jews are the happiest people in America, like the Brooks says, <coughs> you would be prepared to say, we need to put the full resources of science behind getting more people to be Orthodox Jews or evangelical well, Christians. Well, no, 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 because you can be happy for bad reasons. reasons. I mean, you can be delusional, and I think I think that kind of happiness is. I wouldn't concede. They, they may say they're happier. But just suppose they really were. I mean, obviously there's. Well, no, no, but no, but the suppose thing is, that, suppose okay. the evidence said that they actually were. It wasn't a scale artifact. Yeah, yeah. What would you do? Well, no, because because the 
I have a bias, and I think we all share this bias, uh, which, which is to say, which suggests that actually having our beliefs track reality, however loosely, is better in the long run than being delusional. Okay, now you can, you can carve out for me this kind of island of bliss, delusional bliss, which um, may be a counterpoint to where we're tending to go. And maybe it actually is a, uh, maybe, maybe it actually is more pleasurable in some sense, but it's, it's, it's certainly fragile and w vulnerable to the insults of reality. So, you know, all the people who, who uh, um, are, you know, the Orthodox Jew, it, there's no way that fundamental Christianity and Orthodox Judaism is a, su a sufficiently robust software package to be running on your brain to be, to, to be a, a, the perfect circumstance of human flourishing. I just, I just think that's, I, th I think it's impossible given the requirements of living in this world together. Uh, and given how responsive we want to be to, to uh, given the utility of science, given the utility of actually knowing how disease is spread and knowing how old the... the, the, the okay, but now you've got two criteria. Your, your whole argument had a kind of a precision to it when it was, there's only one criteria human wealth, well-being. No, and we can no, measure it, and we can measure it in the brain, so let's just add it up, and whichever one is the highest wins. But now you're so adding a second criteria. I'm not adding a second one. I'm saying, I'm saying that the, the, the human flourishing will tend to be maximized by, at the very least, having your, your, your beliefs about your, 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 your emotions track the, way, the, the actual reality of your life, the material reality of your life, your actual situation. So, so you ask me, well, why not just if it's all about well-being, why not just take heroin all day long? You know, just get enough heroin and just lie on the couch. Well, um, or why wouldn't I, if, if let's say we came up with a pill that could make me um, indifferent, to, like make me feel joy when bad things happen. Say, wouldn't my w welfare be maximized then? Well, no, well then ask, so, so I could take a pill that would make me happy even when my daughter drowns in the bathtub, okay? Um, <laughs> why, why wouldn't that taking that pill be a good thing? Well, but look at all of the other pieces that, that move when you take that pill. I mean, in what sense could I still love my daughter if I'm indifferent to her drowning in the bathtub? Um, and so when you look clearly at what we mean by love and what we value in life and the kinds of experiences we want to have, both alone and together, then you begin to want to be, to track reality. Now, if the singularity is true and we all upload ourselves onto the, the internet 20 years from now, then things change in a different way, and then in some sense we all are on this island of delusion where we can just sort of manufacture any experience we want, and then, you know, maybe Orthodox Judaism is, a, is, is the right move in that context, but, yeah, Roy. Uh, very, very wonderfully thought-provoking talk. Uh, I used to read a lot of moral philosophy, and one of the last and, and best things was uh, McIntyre's book, uh, After Virtue, and he said morality has been been functional, you know, hence your, your analog to the, uh, the banking crisis and so on. But the problem of morality in modern life is that the, uh, the function of it has sort of got removed. He said traditionally in Western intellectual history it was three, three elements. There was a concept of human nature as it was born in its untutored state, a concept of what one could be if one fulfilled one's telos and so on, which we got mainly from Christianity. Uh, and then moral rules, which were a, a, a way to pass from the one state to another. He said, after the Enlightenment and the secularization, we knocked out the Christian element of what one should and could be, uh, ultimately. And so that left us with a, just the concept of uh, untutored human nature and a bunch of rules, moral rules, but no real reason to follow those rules. Um, uh, and, uh, and so it's sort of been floundering since uh, for a reason. Why should people do what's, what's morally right? right? What I hear you you're saying, and it's very uh, uh, inspiring thought, is that maybe we can turn to science to come up with a new version to replace what is, what is the flourishing. And hence some of these, these descriptions of, you know, are they having the right kind of happiness and is there more right. than happiness and so on. Uh, well, that's, uh, uh, that's a bit of the, the struggle for reconstructing that missing element in the, in the moral triad. But, you know, right. Yeah, but part of what I'm advocating is that we just start the conversation from a different place. We started this conversation with moral talk, and then we're trying to sort of bridge it to science and well-being and other things we care about. And, 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 and many people are, are worried that something is left out. Uh, but I'm saying that what if we just started, forget about morality, what if we just were concerned about human flourishing as 
fully and deeply, not just human flourishing, the flourishing of conscious systems. So we're worried about, we're worried about anything that can suffer and anything that can, can experience happiness to the degree that it can suffer and experience happiness. So we're more concerned about squirrels than we are about flies, and we're more concerned about chimps than we are about squirrels. And, we're, and our, our, our concern tracks a hierarchy of, of, of uh, a hierarchy based on our sense of just what it's like to be those things. And, um, uh, and then we're going to talk about, okay, what do we know about how experience is born of, of the laws of nature and uh, complex systems? And uh, let's figure out how to maximize the well-being of conscious systems. Uh, and if we built computers that could suffer, well, then all of a sudden we would have an, uh, a concern about their suffering. And, and at, at a certain point, someone can come in and say, well, okay, well, what about morality? Uh, what about the values? What about all of these other things? What I'm saying is that as long as we're talking honestly and open-endedly and searchingly about well-being, we are, nothing is left out. And if you're going to say something is left out, it will find a place in, in well-being. And uh, I think it's up to the people who, who say it won't to prove that. I don't think it's up to us to prove that human flourishing and the flourishing of conscious systems matters, or that is, is, a great, is actually the context in which we should have this conversation. Yeah. I, find, sorry. I, I, find, I find your argument for moral re uh, realism pretty persuasive and, and, and really nicely thought out. But there's another <laughs> argument I think you're trying to make, and I disagree with it, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I'm not, which is that science can actually solve real world problems, the real world moral problems of the sort that we struggle with. Right. So one example you give is how much should I give to charity? I give some of my money to charity. I give some of my money for my kids, for luxuries for my kids, private school, toys right. and games and everything. What's the right balance? And it occurs to me that, and I'm interested in what you think about this, that this is sort of question which science isn't going to help us. Science, what science could give us to an increasing degree of precision is a description of what the world would be like, people's minds, people's happiness, mm -hmm. uh, if I do option one versus option two, if I do 10% versus 40%. But it doesn't, it, it isn't, it may be a failure of imagination on my part, but I'm not sure whether science said we have discovered that 30% of your salary is the right amount to give to the Africans. Right, right. And, and it may not be, there may not be an answer like that. I mean, there could, could be 30% for you and 35% for David and modulo differences in your lives and, and in your thinking and in your, ultimately in your brains. Um, and uh, yeah, science may, I mean, there are an infinite number of, of questions that have very simple, straightforward, right, and, right answers that science will never get a purchase on. And, but that, but what, the crucial point for me is that the moment we admit that there are right and wrong answers, whether or not we can ever get them in hand, that changes the way we think and talk about the space, the, space, the, the data space, and the possibility of understanding. So for instance, um, I mean, I, I'm having this conversation in, in the context of an intellectual community and a scientific community that basically thinks morality is just made up. I mean, it's, morality is just made up. I mean, it's just either the, pro, it's the mere, it's merely hammered into us by evolution or it's a pure cultural contingency and there are no right and wrong answers and there's no place to stand to say someone is really, really wrong about morality. And the, the, Nazis, the Nazis were wrong, not just we didn't like them, or we don't want to live that way, but they, were, they, were, they had a conception, they were seeking well-being, even if they didn't admit it, and they were doing it in a way that was not as good as many of the other ways you can seek well-being in this world. Um, and that is, a, that is a scientifically true statement. I want, to, I want us to, to, to admit that, and, what, and that's not contingent upon us ever being able to type in the question into our supercomputer and get the answer, you should give 30%. That, that, that what we have to admit is there's a space of possibility. Your life would, you, our lives would be different if we gave 30% than if we gave 10% or nothing. Uh, and we could be aware of those differences to a greater or lesser degree or ignorant or mis, we could misconceive them. There's a, there's a fact space there to be discovered. Uh, and those differences relate to how the world is, it re relates to how our brains are, it relates to our entanglement with one another in this space, and it's not all just made up. It's not just personal preference and the conversation has to stop there. There are consequences that, 
that we could be aware of or, or ignorant of. What, what, if, what, if, what if the, um, in your landscape, what if the, the Nazis were, are one peak, the Jews are another peak? They both, they both think they're right. But the Nazis just think that you know, the, the Jewish peak is getting in the way of the Nazi peak. Well, no, that, they both, they both think, they have, they both think they, have, they, have, they have truths about the well-being of each other, right. of their own population. Well, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. But see, the, 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 to, to talk to talk about our our actual circumstance is one in which we are all. The challenge is to extend our the, the, the circle of our moral concern to the rest of humanity. I mean, we know that we know that the 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 optimal solution is not going to be 15 people figuring out how to enslave the rest of humanity. I mean, you, we could get 15 people who want to enslave the rest of humanity. But by definition, that's not going to be a peak on my moral landscape. And by definition, that you know, having the, the, the thousand-year Reich was not going to be a peak. I mean, this is, this is, what, this is why I, I, I tend to try to make an end run around a lot of the discussion of consequentialism versus deontology, because I think that that much of the, conversa the conversation about, about these categories has, has relied on, on artificial restrictions on definitions like things like well-being. I mean, the, the intuition that, well, that, that human flourishing, the height of human flourishing may be compatible with Nazism or may, be, may require that we steal organs from the poor or periodically nuke the developing world or raise our children on heroin. I mean, this is the kinds of stuff I get thrown at me when I talk about this. It's, there, there are obvious reasons why those are not going to be peaks on the moral landscape. I mean, the reasons are all the obvious suffering that is going to be born of those practices and all of the, the, the mutual flourishing, the, the possibility of mutual flourishing that's going to be foreclosed. I mean, there's no way we're going to, if all of us were living in a society where we knew that at any moment someone could come just steal your organs, you know, none of us would want to live in that society. I mean, it's, it's not, it's just not, that, that, that answers the, the problem of just how you get to, or, you know, distribute organs to people who need organs. But the idea that that's going to be the optimal answer oh, look, uh, is this, not. I think support Paul's point is you, you're strategically and well using very extreme cases. But let, let me give you a simple, a, 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 what's the extreme right. case? Right. Let's imagine two peaks. This, this is what we're thinking of all together. Peak one thinks, um, I want to distribute the resources we have equitably so that everybody right. has the same amount of resources, right? P2 says, I want to allocate resources as far as your effort, right? right? P1 people say, look, these people over here are getting in the way of us being able to do our job, right? We, we can't have them do that because they're taking away our resources the way they're, they're working, right? Right. These are two different views, and they're well-established views in terms of distribution of resources, and they're both peaks. They've been both peaks, right? But well, we, you can imagine a view in that, Peak one thinks, look, I can't do the equitable distribution with these people monopolizing their resources that way. Right, right. Well, that, well, this is, okay, but this is this in some sense <coughs> is a entailed by my argument that there there are if there are mul multiple peaks on the landscape, they are incompatible, say, and there will be a saddle between them very likely. And so therefore, there will be suffering entailed in. Going, moving down one peak and going up another peak, and that's you know could be true individually, it can be true collectively. That's that's fine if if reality is organized in that way. I think I mean to get at your core point. I mean these these are all very difficult questions, and the idea I'm not sanguine about science just giving us a list of right answers, but we know to a first approximation we know most of we know many of the important right answers. I mean we know that compassion is good and psychopathy is bad. Um, we know the kinds of virtues we would want to uh, maximize in, in the kind of positive social emotions uh, as opposed to, um, and we know, we, you know, a, a Rawlsian approach to fairness uh, is a good heuristic. Um, but I think there are all kinds of specific results in Project One science that, that could change the way we view moral questions and move us to Project Two. So like, you know, Paul Slovic's research, I think, is is uh, kind of mind-boggling in its I mean, just, just the, this um, you know genocide neglect and our insensitivity, our, the fact that our moral intuitions don't scale with number. I don't know if, if uh, I should probably summarize it quickly, but uh, this this one experiment of showing you show people a, a picture of a little girl and say you know how much money would you give to to help uh, her uh, this child in need and people people's empathy is at its 
peak and they, they give the most amount of money they're, they're going to give to this to this cause. And then you show a pic, people a picture of a little boy and say, how much would you give to help this little boy in need? And people's empathy is at a peak and, you, and they'll give the most amount of money. Um, but you show them a picture of the same little boy and the same little girl, and you say, here's a little boy and a little girl who are in need. How much would you give? And their empathy is cut by about 25 percent, and the amount of money they're going to give is cut by about 25 percent. And Slovic, I don't know if this, this research has held up, but Slovic seems to have found that it just continues on downward through the floor, where the more you add bad news and numbers of people, empathy diminishes and, and altruism diminishes. Now, so this is a, a fact, that, for argument's sake, let's say this is a true fact about our moral intuitions. This is a, on a global scale, this is a bug, not a feature. I mean, this is, this is something about us that shouldn't, that we, in terms of maximizing human flourishing, it's pr pretty obvious that this is not a good thing, and that for us to be predisposed to be uninterested in the greatest occasions of human suffering, I mean, I mean like, we will spend three days looking at CNN watching, you know, baby Jessica get rescued from a, a well. But we all just yawn and flip the channel when we hear about a, a, you know, a genocide raging in Rwanda. That marshalling of our, of our emotional and attentional uh, resources, I think, is clearly not optimal and leading to, to massive amounts of human suffering. And um, the fact that science can show us this bug you know, uh, in ourselves, I think can get us to build institutions and laws and tax codes and everything else that correct for it. I mean, we, we, we now know enough to know, and it's, it's like, you know, Jonathan was talking about uh, confirmation bias. Yes, we are all subject to confirmation bias, but our other scientific intuitions and our scientific discourse has allowed us to get around confirmation bias, to correct for it, to be worried about it, to talk about it. Um, and we have all of these other non-optimal, um, quote, moral biases, uh, which we, science can help us get around uh, and uh, correct for. And I think, I think we have, that's the, uh, the role of, of, of institutions. And I mean, we need good laws and good institutions to protect us from our moment-to-moment -moment fa failures of moral intuitions of moral intuition. So, so, for instance, the fact that you and I are not disposed to give 30% of our money away, uh, and if we could rethink it every morning as we look at our bank statement, and we know that rethinking it every morning is just going to give, cause us to give less and less away, but yet we have decided through dispassionate conversation that we really should give 30% away, because that's, given the state of the world, that is the best thing to do. Well, then we should have a a, a mechanism that allows us to do, that forces us to do that even when our, we're, we're not up to the task in a moment-to-moment -moment way. And that's just, you know, science can help there, clearly. Do you think that one pitfall along the way is the misappropriation of the term science uh, or science-based policy? I mean, there certainly are a number of uh, cases in the last hundred years or so. I'm thinking of the Soviets, for example, who, yeah. um, you know, they said that they were uh, attempting to institute a science-based form of well-being right. um, uh, separate from any kind of religious doctrine. Yeah, well, I, I use science, I think science is, I would use science in the broadest possible sense of, you know, when we're talking about truth and facts, and we're talking, you know, about honest observations and and honest reasoning, and so that means so history is part of that. I mean, so JFK was assassinated in 1963. I mean, that's that's a fact. There's a lot of evidence that it happened. We know it happened. Anyone who would doubt it would be doubting it in the context of massive evidence and and and. Is it a scientific fact that he was assassinated? Well, assassinations are not the sort of things we really talk about in science, but yes, it's a scientific fact that he was assassinated. I mean, so it, it's a, we're talking about a larger footprint of just uh, truth claims that are well justified. And science is one uh, band in that. But I, it's, it's, it's not the only band, but it's... I think a term that would help us out here is the distinction between anthropocentric truths and non-anthropocentric truths. It is a fact 
that the Earth is the third planet from the sun. It doesn't matter what we think. Right. It's the fact that JFK was assassinated. These are non-anthropocentric facts. They really, really truly happened. Right. Uh, but then most of the facts that we deal with, or many of them, are what you could call anthropocentric facts. So Sam, it is a fact that you're a great writer. I mean, that you, you're an excellent writer. Now, is that a fact of the universe that is irrelevant, that is regardless of our, our brains and our uh, uh, our evolutionary history, any intelligent creature elsewhere would realize that you're a better writer than most other people? No, it's an anthropocentric fact, but it's still a fact. When we grade our students' papers, we're making evaluations. We're not saying, who am I to judge? It's all relevant. We're saying, you know what? This paper's better than that one. And that's an anthropocentric fact. Well, and that's I, what I was trying to I, get actually, at. Actually, I, I would carve that up a little differently. I mean, there's, there are... John Searle made a very, uh, I'm sure other people have done this, but John Searle made a very clear distinction between how we get confused around subjectivity and objectivity. And we can talk about subjectivity as a matter, and, uh, versus objectivity as a matter of ontology or as a matter of epistemology. And there's a lot of confusion here because there are, there are ontologically subjective facts. Uh, so what's an example? So um, the fact that I'm... I, uh, I have tinnitus and I'm hearing a ringing in my ear right now. Okay, that is, a, that is a subjective fact about me. I can hear ringing. I can report it to you dispassionately. We could test my hearing and find correlates to, uh, to, to it. I'm sure you could investigate my cochlea and find damage, etc. cetera. Um, mo all of mind science, certainly higher cognitive mind science, is based on our correlating ontologically subjective facts with third-person objective facts about the brain, say. So someone comes into the lab, they say they're depressed, they have a whole, there's a whole phenomenology of depression, and we correlate that with physiology. But moral facts aren't about my inner experiences. What kind of fact is, Shakespeare was a great writer. No, but for, what kind no, but of fact is well-being, well-being is, is about inner experience. And it's also, it has third-person correlates, but, but whether or not somebody is experiencing the greatest happiness they can experience is a, is a, ontologically subjective fact about them. Um, but we, that doesn't mean it's merely personal or that we have to be biased in talking about it. And so when some people say, I'm just being subjective, that can, in an epistemological sense, that means biased, merely personal, not at all scientific. This is just my, a whimsical Im impression. That's not, we're not constrained to that kind of talk when talking about subjectivity. I mean, it's, for instance, and again, it, it also doesn't matter whether we can ever get the facts in hand. So here are two questions. At the moment JFK was shot, how many birds were in flight over the surface of the Earth? We have no idea. We will never know. No Manhattan Project could get us that information. And yet, we know there's a numerical answer. Okay? At the moment JFK was shot, what was his last conscious thought? We're never going to know. It is scientifically true to say that there is an answer to that whether we could ever get a purchase on it. And I, I can tell you a wrong answer. Uh, you know, he was not thinking that his last conscious thought was not, boy, I hope I live to the year 2010 so I can watch the fourth season of Mad Men. You know, anyone who would think he was thinking that is almost certainly wrong. Um, uh, and, so that's, and, and so that's just, the, we're not, there is no problem in talking scientifically about human subjectivity or the subjectivity of any other system. And we have to admit that we can be right and wrong about it. That's the only constraint. It, it seems to me is that the premise of your book can be stated succinctly by saying that there are non anthropocentric facts like physics, that is the true regardless of what kinds of creatures we are, and then there are moral facts, and moral facts are non anthropocentric facts. That's, I think, what you're saying. I think that's not true. There are moral facts. I'm not a relativist. I'm not somebody who says, oh, well, I like, you know, I like kindness, but, you know, you like genocide, or whatever your example was from your TED talk. Um, our choice is not between non epicentric facts and subjective, wispy nonsense. Our choice between different kinds of facts, and there are a lot of facts, like about whether someone is beautiful, whether something tastes good, whether something is ethical. These are facts of a kind. They're never going to be the facts of physics, and I think you want to make them. Oh, no, okay, but this, again, this is it's not uh, as it doesn't fall into those bins. I'm not saying that morality exists like the Platonic form of the good, independent of human experience. It is, it is, it is dependent upon experience. I mean, we're talking about experience. It's an anthropocentric fact. But it's not it's not anthropocentric in the sense of you know I have money in my pocket. Do I really have money in my pocket? Well, yes. Is it really money? Well, it's, it, it's paper, and it's only money because we have, it, we've, we, as a social construct, we've agreed to call it money. 
and we could decide it's no longer money. So it's, it's not a fact like money. It's, de it's, it's deeper than money. Those, I mean, that, that I would say is a truly an anthropocentric fact. You know, money is a socially constructed, we've agreed that it's money, and we could change our view. And it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's completely contingent upon our deciding how to play the game with it. Clearly, moral facts and the possibility of flourishing reaches deeper than that in the sense that we could all be ignorant, in fact, we surely are ignorant, of the, the larger possibilities of experience. I mean, if we changed our genome in just this way, or we changed our language in just this way, or we changed our, our um, uh, approach to, to science in just this way, our experience would change and we could be completely ignorant about how that, or mistaken about how that, those changes would occur. And that's just to say this is a horizon past which we can't see. And what's, what's the best way to talk about that horizon and explore it and try to foresee the effects of various changes? Well, I think it's scientific and reasoned discourse. Um, yeah? So I'm, I'm trying to figure out who you disagree with. Uh, and, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good, and, that's a good and, heuristic. Uh, it, 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 at first, it might sound like you're sort of assuming a kind of very narrow utilitarian view as the moral truth, saying the right thing to do is what's going to maximize the aggregate sum of uh, pleasant over unpleasant conscious states, and that's what we should do. And then, of course, there you have a problem saying, what about all these other values that people care about? There's been a long debate about this, and it's not just a trivial debate. And then I hear you saying, well, I mean something much more broad than that. I mean flourishing in this broader sense. And anything that you throw at me that sounds like something that would really be worth caring about, my notion of flourishing is going to encompass that. Right. And then I'm wondering, OK, so you're saying we should stand up and fight and care about flourishing broadly defined. Uh, and now I'm wondering who disagrees with you. Uh, I mean, I know that there are some pomo anthropologists who will, who, who will say, who am I to judge the Taliban? But I don't hear a lot of that either in my intellectual circles or in, or, or in public discourse. I mean, one sort of you know, kind of sociological thought experiment. Can you imagine or can you find a politician in this country who will stand up and say, I don't believe in moral truth uh, and, and get elected next time? I mean, I'm not sure you can get away with that in Cambridge, maybe Berkeley. Uh, but but I, 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 don't, I don't know. I'll give you an example. I mean, this is a, what was a very formative experience for <coughs> me was um, Actually, Jonathan was at this meeting. We were at a meeting at the Salk Institute. And I gave a short talk giving, making noises somewhat of this sort. And I, at one point in the talk, I said, for instance, we know that the Taliban is not a, a culture that maximizes human well-being. I mean, this is just, this is one of the wrong, history's wrong answers, and we can admit it. And it's not unscientific to admit it. Uh, and somewhat, someone came up to me at the end of the talk and said, uh, well, how could you ever say that compulsory veiling is wrong from a scientific point of view. And I said, well, it's wrong from a scientific point of view because I think right and wrong relate to human and animal well-being, and forcing women to live in bags is clearly not a way of maximizing well-being. And she said, well, that's just your opinion. And I said, well, OK, let's make it simpler. Let's say we found a culture that was just removing the eyeballs of every third child. Uh, and would you then agree that we had found a culture that was not maximizing human well-being? And she said, well, it would depend on why they were doing it. And I said, OK, well, let's say they're doing it for religious reasons. They have a book which says every third should walk in darkness or some such nonsense. And then she said to me, well, then you could never say that they were wrong. Now, this person had just delivered, this person is now on Obama's Council of Bioethics, one of 13 people advising him on all the ethical implications of you know, science, scientific progress. Um, this person had just delivered a totally lucid lecture on the implications of neuroscience for the law and how she was worried about fMRI technology and lie detection and how this was an invasion of cognitive liberty um, and how we could be exposing people to oxy... She was especially exercised that we might be exposing captured terrorists to oxytocin as a way of encouraging greater trust and that this was a violation of human rights. Okay, so this dichotomy of you have to be non-judgmental about re removing the eyeballs of children Right on the one hand, and yet we have to be uh, just burdened by an insane scrupulosity with respect to I oxytocin and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. This, this dichotomy held in balance in one person's brain is something I'm responding to. 
On the other hand, I'm also responding to all the people in our culture who think you can get morality out of religious prescriptions. So, you know, we, we are now a society that talks not about nuclear proliferation or genocide, but about gay marriage. Uh, and it seems to me if you want to say that gay marriage should be illegal, you should have to make an argument that it causes harm, and here is how it, here is how it causes harm. And yet we're, the, the, the standard of mor our moral discourse now is you don't even have to argue that it causes harm. You just have to argue that it's wrong, full stop. My faith tells me so. My, my tradition tells me so. The Bible tells me so. There is no argument that has to be made in terms of consequences. And I'm saying we have to steal the ground from under that discourse and say that the only thing that counts is an argument that talks about human flourishing and human well-being. Unless you can tell me how human well-being is undermined by gay marriage, you're not actually talking about morality. I was going to say that goes back to your response to, to John's point about fundamentalist Christians, which your response was different than what I would expect. That it's an empirical question who is subjectively happier and lives a richer life, fundamentalist Christians or secular atheists. Right. Um, who gives more to charity, who, who loves your children more. And you know, the evidence is actually kind of mixed. It's a hard question. Right. I thought what you would say is, as scientists, we're going to look at this data, see how it turns out, and then we'll make our, our, our decision. You know, and it could change. It could, it could, but, but your immediate response was, seemingly, that you were repelled almost on, on moral grounds above the science about fundamental questions, which is they believe the wrong things. And that, in itself, is, is a value that needs to be taken into consideration, which is something I agree with you on, but seems very different from your program of always asking the question, subjective well-being. Well, no, no, it's, it's not subjective. It's not just subjective. It's subjective well-being, again, is largely predicated on actually having beliefs that track reality. I mean, how we need to understand why we're not all dying of the... We, but but really, so, so a lot of reality is a bummer. So, yeah. so you have a system that tracks the truth, and you might end up with people who are pretty miserable, which, which I'm I, fine with. I, I'd rather be true and, and well, miserable. Well, no, no, but you'd rather, be, you'd, you'd rather be true and miserable up to a point. I mean, you can imagine situations... No, no, all the way. <laughs> you, can, you can imagine situations in which you would rather not have complete information if having complete information would paralyze you and get you killed and bereave everyone who cares about you. I mean, right. you can imagine a situation where... You know, there's no way I was going to escape from this burning building if I actually knew how the odds were stacked against me. But given the fact that I just, I didn't know, I had all the emotional resources and I got out of the building alive. Uh, and there's, so there, there are more global situations which we can imagine where, yeah, having perfect information is not a good thing. And we don't want, who but wants it, does, it does sound like you're making an empirical claim that there, it is very possible that there's one untrue belief that would make everybody happier and that would cause very little misery in the world. Right there is yeah. so the little yeah. green man in my closet, you know, sings to me at night, and and I never tell anybody about him, um, but it turns out that this brings me up like well, ten but, average happiness. What I would the other piece you have to add is you can't believe it. That we're we're not wired in such a way as to be able to believe things we think are false but want to be true, uh, knowingly. I mean, we, there's such a thing as self-deception, and there are kind of cultures yeah, that. But, but we're seemingly see wired them. to believe a lot of things that are probably false. So, so we're seemingly wired to believe a lot of things yeah. that are probably false, yeah. and, and it doesn't seem to me that believing these things, it, just because they're not truth tracking, would automatically, even even sort of over well, time yeah. on a large scale, would always bring misery. It's, an, it's, t it's a totally intelligible claim to say that there are things, there are ways we could be misled about the nature of reality that in the end would be good for us. I think that's, and, and for someone to say, no, no, it's better just to always know the truth no matter what. I don't think that's an honest position because when you start stacking stuff on the scale of no matter what, you know, okay, everyone's going to die. You know, okay, let's just publish the recipe for synthesized smallpox everywhere and not just publish it, actually just teach everyone how to manufacture it. Why not do that? Well, there are obvious reasons not to do that, but yet that is somehow pre biasing us toward the, the virtue of just free exchange of information. It's, it's, it's privileging information over everything else. It's a stupid thing to do. Why is it stupid? Because it's obviously stupid. I think we should take lunch yeah. on that. No. <laughs> Sorry.